Today's reading comes from Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, the message. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed into a side. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. This is what he said. You are blessed when you are at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and God's will. You are blessed when you feel you have lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You are blessed when you are content with just who you are, no more, no less. That is the moment you find yourselves proud, owner, proud owners of everything that cannot be bought. You are blessed when you have worked up a good appetite for God. God's food and drink is the best meal you'll ever eat. You are blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You are blessed when you get when you get your inside world, your mind, and your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You are blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That is when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You are blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer, even, for though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds, and know that you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. Our continuing text this morning because it was in, on video, and there was no video. So we'll just imagine what uh, Chris and Neff might have said about practicing compassion. Let me say to you at the very beginning, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be safe, may you be healthy, may you live with ease, may you live in peace. After visiting one of, one of my doctors this week, it seems like practicing compassion is a little like a doctor practicing medicine. First time I had some issue with uh, an irregular heartbeat, years, some, many years ago, my, my GP referred me to his favorite cardio, cardiology practice. And, and I was driving that morning to the, to the doctor to meet this cardiologist and his cardiology practice, and I thought to myself, you know, I don't want to go to a cardiologist who's still practicing. <laughs> And to make matters worse, when I needed to have more tests at Washington Hospital Center, they referred me to the surgical practice of one of the best heart surgeons in Washington, D.C. He was the best, but he was still practicing. Okay, I'm not going to take this any further, but you get my point? In the same way that doctors, even the very best ones, practice medicine, I think, I was thinking all of you, that we are called as human beings, as people of faith, to practice compassion. Doctors live out their superb training and, their, they, and apply their, their one awesome uh, skills to help us live healthy lives. Uh, you know, to overcome disease and, and illness, we come to count on them, to trust them. And in the same way, my friends, we are called to live out our faith expressed in acting loving kindness. Kindness even to evil or in caring, careful ways all the days of our lives. And to hope all that love, kindness, and compassion lead to good, healthy lives and relationships for all people. 
When my doctor or nurse takes my blood pressure, and I've had that done many times, they seem to do it automatically, you know, without even thinking about it. I know it's kind of a part of their, their DNA. They just do it as a part of the DNA, and if you forget and have your legs crossed, they just, they notice that as they're paying attention to all the stuff, they tell you to uncross your legs, and they pay attention to the heart rate, the beat, the pace, uh, the sound, certain pattern, and rhythm, and the qualities of the heart, and they know what all that means. You know, in terms of what they should do to help you have a healthy life. Well, is this not what we do when we encounter our family, our friends, our worker, co-workers, our fellow students, our people in the grocery store line, and fellow drivers of cars on the highway? Pay attention to them in ways that allow us to hear and see what's going on with them, treating them in the ways that bring health and wholeness and joy to our shared lives. I'm on a, on, I'm on a campaign to try to improve human relationships in the grocery store lines. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Yesterday we were at the going to a movie and the line was very long. My wife was over here with us today, was one knee on her little scooter and, and, and being impatient. And there are two women who up at the front who looked like they never had never been to the movies before and they couldn't figure out how to buy a ticket. And it just went on and on and on. I didn't say anything to Pat, but I stopped. I gathered myself up and I practiced compassion. I wasn't critical. I just took a breath. <laughs> Paying attention without having, as one of the little guys was saying, that I need to think about what uh, kind of, what kind of thing I could do for ER. But practicing with paying attention without having to think about it helps us treat others with the greater for the greater good and for the world around us. The Buddhist teacher, the Saiku Ikeda, says, as we work for the greater good, we build happiness for ourselves and others. Maybe that's what Jesus meant in the seventh verse of the Beatitudes when he says, you're blessed when you care, when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. Or to paraphrase it, you're blessed when you are compassionate. At the moment of being compassionate, that is when you receive compassion and experience compassion. What did the Dalai Lama say? What you wish to experience, provide to the other. This may be one of those lovely places where the teachings of the Buddha and Jesus are in sync together in a way that blesses us and hopefully inspires us today. We know the power of this reciprocation that goes on between our kindness and the kindness received for someone else. But as we look around in our world and as we stand in the grocery store line and we watch the news and we read the paper, we must be sadder than Eeyore could ever, ever imagine about the status of this in the world today. And I want to say something that I haven't said yet because it hasn't been one of the, the themes of, of this, but practicing compassion, my friends, starts with us. It starts with being compassionate for, to ourselves. And I'm just wondering, you don't have to raise your hand, but I'm just wondering, how many of you have shown some compassion to yourself this week? How many of you have been kind and good to yourself? Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is not the self-serving narcissistic egotism that we think about in our whole world. How many times as children we talk never to always to think about the other person, right? I'm not talking about that kind of self-care and self-love and self-compassion. Being kind and good to ourselves so that we are able to be equipped to be kind and loving to the other person. And I venture to suggest to you, if you can't do it for you, you don't do it for your world for anybody else. 
that's good psychology, right? Psychologists and counselors. But you know, there's a warning here, and I, I don't know, I got this stuck in my brain a couple weeks ago about, about this. Uh, Buddhist teaching also says that the more we do for the other people, the more the path of our own happiness will open up. And in realizing this, we stuff discover a sense of gratitude and being able to help them. And when there's a balance between that, I think it's wonderful and you can get that blessing. But when we seek to help others beyond what they really need, and I, I need to hear this sermon, I've practiced this very, very well for the last couple of weeks with my wife because she's on, she had her foot operated on, she's needed lots of care and attention, and there have been some times when I was helping her a lot more than what she needed. <laughs> and she told me so. <laughs> Somewhere in psychology, we call that, uh, when we do that, let me, let me back up, when we do that to our own self-detriment, taking care of other people, we call that codependency. Right? And codependency, my friends, is not necessarily compassion. When we take care of others beyond what we need for ourselves. Sometimes we do that, I know I do it to make myself feel better. Boy, I, I love to help you. Oh gosh, I just love to help you because it makes me feel really good about myself. You just let me, please. But I suppose that's another sermon for another time. But it is a sermon I need to hear, so I might have to preach it. Let, I want to get to a couple of powerful stories of compassion practice with great care and skill, because I think we learn from the great big stories of compassion shown in the world. Dr. Izel Hin Abuzalaze, why am I murdered that? He's a Palestinian, was at his hospital in Gaza. This was in 19, or in 2009. Dr. Abuzalaze, I'm sorry, Abuzalaze, practicing medicine. When Israeli bombs hit his home in the Israeli Gaza War of 2009, killed his three precious daughters, aged 20, 15, and 13, and some more members of his family. This kind doctor, grieved beyond the telling, cried till his heart was broken. But in addition to practicing medicine, he practices compassion to this very day. And he said then, and he says now, that hate and resignation were not options at all for him. He was not raised that way, and he had raised his children and to understand that hate and resentment were not part of their DNA. So since he raised his daughter to be human beings who would love all humanity, he could not hate. And of course, he felt anger, he says, but his powerful sense of love and compassion helped him in 2009 and helped him until this very day to transform his anger and his frustration about the war in the Middle East to courage and compassion and wisdom that might help him to change and transform the situation there in the Middle East. He said, in hate and resentment and judgment of others, we become blind to the goodness around. So life gives us countless opportunities, my friends, to see or hear or witness compassion. Every single day of our lives, many times. Can we even imagine this doctor's response to the death of his daughters? Can we imagine the difference his actions might have made in the world around him? Close at home, but no, no less dramatic. The Amish parents and families of the 10 girls, and the story is from over 10 years ago, 10 girls shot in 2006 in the West Nickel Mine School near Lancaster, five of them killed by Charles Carl Robbins, who went into that school with a, with a gun and started shooting. This is another powerful story of both compassion and forgiveness. The five girls were killed as was Roberts by his own hands. That very night, parents of one of those kid, girls who was killed went to the mother of Carl of Roberts 
to give her comfort and care and to show her compassion. That was the first thought and response of the families to that horrible tragedy. Can you imagine that? It's in their DNA. I'm certain they grieve, and they must hurt beyond the telling. But how they respond to people who hurt them or their children is just different from the normal, from the rest of us, really. Most of us see in the rest of the country and the world and our own lives, for that matter, a very different kind of default setting of how people respond with such compassion. We, we are much more likely to respond with anger and revenge and punishment in mind in such, a, in such extreme cases, even in the little incidents that happen in our lives, like the grocery store line on the highway. And these are big stories, and they raise the expectation levels beyond anything we or could ever, ever, ever imagine for ourselves. But they are instructive to us, my friends, about how we can live our lives in the day-to-day, -day, in the little things in our lives. <clears throat> Let me just uh, suggest quickly that there are sort of six ways to practice compassion. There are six parts or elements of this default setting that I keep talking about. The default setting of responding, of compassion, without even thinking about it. One of the very basic assumptions is, is just the, that great desire to wish all persons to be free of suffering, including ourselves. The wish to relieve suffering and its causes, coupled with the urge to act in order to do something about it. Jean Bolton, first thing, she, she didn't say hello to me this morning. She's, she had a sense of, of concern and compassion about the people in, in your area, in West Virginia, Lord, and wanted us to tell us to do something about it. That in itself, I, I, I appreciate just, just, just having that care and that thought. And then, thinking of it, not, not, without even thinking about it, let's take an offering, let's do something about it, folks. Mario goes there, whether you did it or not. So the very fundamental basic assumption is wishing all persons to be free of suffering, including ourselves. Now there's learning how to show empathy. Empathy and sympathy get very confused, and sympathy, sympathy sometimes gets a bad rap, but but empathy is our ability to resonate with or to share in another person's emotion while also recognizing that the primary emotion resides in the other person. And we walk in their shoes so that we wonder what it might be like to not get to your house because it's flooded out or to stand on the foundation of your house in the west where the fires are burning or the floods are going and to have nothing. That's part of the practice of compassion. And thirdly, compassion ends, begins and ends with love. It's just the core of it. It begins, it ends. Showing, the fourth one is showing a sense of kindness. That's why I asked the kids this morning to say something kind to Eeyore. Rather than judging, I know I'm a kind person. I know I have a lot of compassion. But I'll tell you, I know those situations where I've got nothing but judgment going on, right? First Sunday in this series, the grocery store line, whoo, places like that, it's just my default setting, it's just there. We're called on to, to first respond out of kindness and then figure out what's going on instead of judging. Maybe that's, uh, that's what Jesus meant in the night of these uh, uh, Beatitudes, you're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. And then the next is giving attention to the common good, to common humanity. Rather than being isolated in our own suffering and our own victimness or in suffering of others and forgetting to see the world around us. Maybe that's what Jesus meant when he said, you're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. And then finally, being mindful. Just paying attention. Being mindful. 
Instead of over-identifying with our own lives and our own problems and our own desire to get into the movie theater so we can get our popcorn and our, and our Coca-Cola and see all of, the, all of the previews and get settled in. It's not about me all the time. Maybe that's what Jesus meant in, the, in verse 8. You're blessed when you get your inside world. Your mind and heart put it right, then you can see God in the outside world. Starting with ourselves, wishing all people to be free of suffering, living out of empathy for another, believing and acting on the belief that compassion begins and ends with love, showing kindness, not judgment, dedicated to be dedicated to the fostering of the common good for all humanity, and being mindful of others and acting on what you see in the experience. Those are the false settings that make up this whole idea and process of practice. Let me finish. The doc I saw this week has always been an excellent diagnostician. She is superb. But as she has done in the last two times I've seen her, she walked into the exam room, went immediately to the little table with the computer on it, and sat down, turned the laptop computer on, and started working at that laptop and didn't look at me for a second. She spent the next 20 minutes engaged with the laptop, once in a while looking at me, asking me a question or two about what happened last year and the visit, etc. But not much. She's a couple years away from retirement, I know, and since she said, and maybe this is too much that you want to know, I asked her when my next colonoscopy was, and, uh, and she said in, in 2020, um, I asked if she'd be here to give me that exam, and she wasn't sure because she might be retiring. And then she launched into a bit of a tirade about the practice of medicine and how it's changed and how she doesn't have the time or the ability to sit and notice people. She said that before I could sit and watch you, and I get 50% of my diagnosis information from watching your body language, Jerry. And I said, well, so much for that today. I hope your, the rest of your diagnostic ability was working overtime. <laughs> and she did it. All the stuff she's putting into the computer, she said, doesn't really end up in one of those electronic databases anyway that helps all of us, like the government says it would. And that's another issue. So much of the new techniques seem to just get in the way of her being a practitioner of medicine that she used to be. But then she stood up and walked over in front of me, put her hand on my shoulder in front of me, and said, be well. And my heart moved. Indeed, and may you all this day and in the days to come be well. Be happy, be safe, be healthy, live with ease, and live in peace. May it be so with you and with me and all of us this day. <coughs>
And we thank you for the, the compassion of this church, the passion of, of its leaders and, and all of those gathered here today as we, uh, we think about what we can do to make the world a better place. And you've heard the prayers of all of those lifted up for peace and, and, and harmony and, and support as people go through difficult times. You've heard the joys expressed for gratitude and, and hope for the world. We pray all of this in the name of the one who teaches us to pray together always, saying, Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Please stand if you're able for the prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, living Christ, for inviting us and people of all spiritual paths, ages, genders, mental and physical abilities, races, economic levels, political perspectives, sexual orientations, and fellowships into this 